I mean, we're, we're in the realm of speculation here, but it, do you think if there is intelligent life somewhere else, there we will see resemblances to what we have on Earth? No. <laughs> Shucks, as you okay. No, I, I don't uh, think so, but the problem is how would we recognize it if, uh, if, if it is not in some way uh, <clears throat> similar to what we recognize as intelligence? This is, this is our big problem, is that we are mm. prisoners of our own cognitive system. And we really can't imagine what it is subjectively like to be any other kind of animal. And perhaps the problem is most acute of all uh, with something like Neanderthals, which are so close to related and yet weren't us. So near and yet so far. What is it like to be a creature that is almost like us, but not quite like us? You can't just say, okay, well, you know, let's knock uh, 10... IQ points off the average IQ, and that's what... No. The, any, if you don't perceive the world the way that we do, then you are looking at an absolutely alternative kind of way of, of being intelligent. And we're not capable of properly perceiving that because we're prisoners of our own way of looking at the world. Uh, well, the, that echoes very much Thomas Nagel's very famous essay about what is it like to have mm -hmm. the mind of a bat. Uh, uh, most, uh, most remarkable essay. Yeah. Um, but I think you're, <coughs> again, too pessimistic, <coughs> uh, because, yes, indeed, these animals have their cognitive substrate, and as I think I mentioned, they do particular things for very good reasons, and they don't really have to do anything else, and brains are expensive and all these good things, so you can see why you don't go to extravagant things. And to be sure, we may live in a very blinkered world, but my goodness me, <laughs> it's infinitely larger than any other world, and again, because of to reiterate that, you know, our endless curiosity about things. And my hunch, I hope, would be that if there was somebody who did decide to come and visit us or make communication, oh, by the way, there's nobody there at all, but I'll let you on to that later. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Let's just go where it goes, I suppose. Um, then I, I, I would I feel that, you know, it's not so much whether they had um, four legs or two legs or six legs or anything like that. I'm not care. I don't really care too much about that. I'm sure they would have camera eyes for instance, absolutely certain. I know what enzymes they would use, no question there, that's a simple one. Um, but it's really the biological properties, you know, it's, it's, it's not so much the anatomy. And as indeed Humboldt and Darwin, when they first went to South America in particular, were gobsmacked, because here was, a, at first sight, an utterly alien biosphere. But of course, they very quickly realized what was going on in the background with that. Let me follow up on your point about camera eyes. And I know you've uh, done research on this. I mean, this is one of the, the famous examples of convergence. There are what, like mm. six different evolutionary Some, yeah. tracts of uh, the evolution of camera eyes. Why, why does an intelligent, a highly intelligent animal need camera eyes? Um, well, it's not that insects are stupid, far from it. Their brains are miniature miracles of engineering, <clears throat> and they use compound eyes, many lenses together. What one does observe is to the first approximation, the animals which move fast are predators and tend towards intelligence, tend to employ the camera eye. And a classic example, of course, is a comparison between the octopus and our own eye. Uh, there's even a jellyfish, for goodness sake, which has camera eyes. Uh, it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit of a spoiler, because it turns out, in fact, they've got this superbly designed eye, very, very small. <clears throat> and the uh, light comes into the lens and is beautifully focused, fantastic, hats off. Only one small problem, the light focuses behind the eye. Oh, God, got to get this right. Uh, and there's been a lot of discussion why this might be the case. It's not at all clear. Um, but I, I think the, the question with this, again, is you can stand back and say, well, actually, there are 50 or 60 types of eye. There are ones which use mirrors, for example, amazing things. But to the first approximation on this planet, you see in abundance, compound eyes, mostly in insects, but convergent, or camera eyes. And Kuno Kirschfeld, a very distinguished German physiologist, and we weren't allowed to use PowerPoint, quite right too, but he did a calculation as to the size of eye the human would require if we could only use a compound eye, such as you might find in a fly. And in fact, with great respect, you two would actually have to move slightly away from me. The eye would be about <laughs> this across. <laughs> so the visual acuity of that eye is far superior than the one the insect possesses. And then you get carried away, as I will do now, 
and they point out, of course, the octopus eye is not identical to our eye. If it was, I'd be very worried. Each one has an evolutionary footprint on it. And then they say, well, actually, as it so, so turns out, the retina of the squid is on the outside of the pile of cells, whereas, as I'm sure you all know, our retina is buried. And the reason is our retina is an outgrowth of the brain. But in point of fact, it doesn't matter at all, because you would think actually having an eye where light has to percolate its way through additional layers of cells before it reaches the retina is a very bad deal indeed. No problem. We have this amazing, the things called Muller cells, this system of fiber optics. And again and again, we see things which are convergent in a really deep, interesting way. It's not just they look similar, but when you begin to unpack them, the whole functional organization comes together. So Ian, would you concede the point that a highly intelligent creature, wherever, would have a camera eye? I don't think we can, we can make a priori <laughs> assumptions at all about other kinds of uh, intelligence, kinds of intelligence that we haven't observed, that we can't, that we can't actually observe. I don't know what other forms of intelligence would be like, and so I have no idea what they would require as ancillary inputs for, uh, I mean, presumably you have to have a sensory system uh, to, to complement your intelligence, which is the way that you manipulate information about the world. So I think you, we, could, we could agree that there would be some way of receiving information um, about the world. But I don't think we could make any, any, uh, any, 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 any more specific hypotheses uh, than that. Um, again, if we're looking for intelligence in our own image, I think we're probably going to be uh, disappointed um, after an exhaustive uh, search <laughs> of the uh, cosmos. But um, <coughs> that is something that really is impossible to speculate about you know, at, at the moment.